Good day chaps. So today's video is going to cover a popular request vehicle. It's the FV4202, built by Leyland Motors between 1955 and 1956 as a technology test bed to explore new ideas and concepts for the proposed next British tank, then simply known as the medium gun tank. The 4202 was never a true tank, being custom made for some new parts along with leftovers, a sort of bubble and squeak vehicle, and never a real fighting platform. The UK had begun to look for a new vehicle to become its mainstay following the Second World War. It had three vehicles to choose from. These were the Comet, which while a good wartime vehicle showed its age and lineage fairly quickly post-war, compared to Soviet and American advances. The Centurion, which, ironically, the government didn't initially want to go with and would become one of the most successful tanks ever made, and the A45 and later FV201, which had a miserable life from becoming the first universal tank to ending up being an overweight chubby heavy tank only made in limited numbers as Conqueror. It might be surprising, then, that they wanted a new medium tank by the 50s, even though Centurion was proving more than capable. This was partly due to the older memos and papers suggesting it would be phased out of service, and the failings of the FV201 left them in a bit of a fluster. Not to mention they were preoccupied with the IS-3, and would remain so for years after, with an obsession on defeating the fat slow kid and not focusing on the real threat, which was the T-54 series, which Boris, meanwhile, was busy spamming out in the thousands. However, the UK felt that the Centurion would need to be upgunned and up-armoured to be more viable in the future, but at the time didn't have the capability to do so. This was later compounded in 1956, during the Hungarian Uprising, when a captured T-54 was driven into the British Embassy and evaluated for a day. Although it could not be accessed or cut into, overinflated reports on its armour called into question the 20-pounder's gun capability and put the final nail into the FV-201 as a gun tank. The new medium gun tank, meanwhile, had begun as far back as 1951, as ideas, and had taken some time to formulate. Sometimes referred to as medium gun tank number two, this isn't actually the case early on, where there were several schemes laid out, and at some point, scheme two became known as the gun tank two. These early ideas then went to paper in 1952. They were an odd collection of designs, but covered a wide range of vehicles. These early vehicles also had cleft or bifurcated turrets proposed, in which the turret is built up to the left and right hand side of the gun, which is mounted between the two sections and can allow a larger gun than average to be fitted. These vehicles, as per the original specs requested, would need to be no more than 45 tonnes, and so drastic new ideas had to be considered. Both the medium gun tank number two and the Centurion were drawn up in such a manner on the 9th of January 1952. The Centurion one, which was made, was based on the Centurion Mark III, according to the notes from an FVRDE research group. This system would test a 20-pounder liquid propellant gun, which still survives at Shrivenham. The converted Centurion, of which sadly no pictures have been found, was finally used up on gun ranges to test how the interior rear survived being struck, while the cleft turreted medium gun tank would stay more or less at the stage of drawings. The FERDE had established some of these key points. The new vehicle would need an internal gun mantlet, rather than an external one, as well as a reclined driver's position, which would lower the vehicle's height. Again, these were actually first tested on various modified Centurion parts. The next stage was a choice of what gun to use. The idea of liquid propellant guns had been dropped as they could not get consistent mixes and results, although the idea remains of interest even today. These guns ranged in calibre from 105 to 130mm in choice and were either bag charge, separate or solid case rounds, with their various pros and cons, and each was calculated for APDS, HESH, 
and armor piercing capped ballistic cap rounds as follows. While all of this was being considered, in 1954, work had begun on establishing whether the medium gun tank number no. 2 could be fitted with a 120mm gun that was a breech loaded quick firing gun, as seen in the FVRDE report PC23. This involved a 120mm with a bag charge and a sliding block breech mechanism with ring obturation, an idea snaffled from the Germans. This was because the predicted 120mm solid rounds would be too large to stow in the turret and would thus take up space in the hull, increasing the vehicle's volume if enough ammunition was to be carried. To test this idea, the weapon would be built into a modified 20 pounder gun and used on a new test bed being designed by Leyland, the FV 4202. Leyland, who had won the contract to make the new medium gun tank, now referred to as FV4201, set to building a series of test beds. This resulted from some painful wartime experience of building stuff too quickly, without adequate testing, which had resulted in some of the tanks made by us being a complete dog's dinner. And so each idea would be tested and considered and changes made as needed. Leyland, as said, built three hulls. These were each made out of separate parts and each part is recorded by weight and size and they produced the manual with photos and descriptions of each part made and catalogued. Most parts of the three test beds were custom made out of unarmoured steel with various leftovers thrown in from Centurion tanks such as the wheels of which there are five pairs either side and the original tracks were of an early Centurion tank as well. The gun used was a 20 pounder, however it's not known if the weapon was modified as mentioned before, as frankly the surviving vehicles have been so neglected and poorly looked after, it's probably not been checked. The working parts of the hull used Centurion automotive features, as those were what were lying around at the time, and the idea was just there to see if a crewman could be replaced in a reclined driving position. As the vehicles were never to be placed into service, the idea of creating a whole new setup was pointless. It was done to measure volume more than anything else. The turret itself was cast out of unarmoured steel to a suitable thickness for that of the proposed FV4201. This was again to account for weight but also volume of material to see if such aspects were viable. Contrary to some videos on the subject, the turret is not half a centurion and the rear end bears no semblance to one. It's just 30 millimeters of rolled steel. The engine for the 4202 was a Rolls-Royce Meteorite 202B, which again did not have some 400 horsepower as quoted, but was rated in this instance at 520 brake horsepower at 2,700 revs, linked to a V52 gearbox giving around 12.4 horsepower per ton, enough to trundle about and test various features. Despite being referred to as the 40 ton Centurion Online, the name does not crop up in any of the original official documents, just FV4202. The vehicle weighs 40.8 tons fully laden, 5 tons less than the proposed FV4201 would have weighed. It's also worth noting that this vehicle has nothing to do with the Centurion Mantlus turret tank, often referred to incorrectly as Action X which came about five years later for an entirely different purpose. As mentioned before, three holds were made for testing various ideas, and then the information from that went back to the Chieftain's development. After this, they were pretty much dumped. One went to Borrington that was in good condition. Another one went to the Royal Electrical Mechanical Engineers, where it ended up on their range, being stuck in some mud for towing exercises. And the third is more of a mystery. Two stories crop up. The first is that it was converted to an armoured recovery vehicle by Remy and is at their current museum. This isn't true and the current museum has said as much. They have a Centurion conversion amongst others, but not this. The second story is that it went to Israel. However, after speaking to several sources who work there and are very familiar with the collection, they have stated that this is bollocks. So where it went is a bit of a mystery. 
The Bobbington vehicle is also quite a sad tale, as the original vehicle they had was in good condition, so why they felt obliged to give it a chop shop job is unknown. But since then, it had been neglected to the point it's in a very bad state, with corrosion eating away much of the original soft steel and the internals having collapsed. It has been gathering dust now for the last six years, and no further attempts to look after it have been done. Perhaps at some point in the future, they might decide that it's an important vehicle and make some effort to restore it. Well guys, we'll leave this here for now. If you like this or want to know more, join our Discord of Tanky People. If you have more questions, ask below. I try and respond as much as I can. And do feel free to give us a like or a sub. Until next time, toodle pip.